Well, have you noticed as you look around, in fact, as I look around, uh, entering my seventh decade, uh, I just turned 60, so that means I'm entering my seventh decade, looking back over six, the world is getting darker. Uh, I remember as a little boy that there were things that people whispered about that we knew were so bad they never said in public. And in this generation, in fact, to almost every teenager and, and uh, up person uh, in our culture, they have heard things as badges almost of honor that people say, I am this, and they're declaring that they are committing a sin that God says those who commit this sin will suffer the vengeance of eternal fire and their part is for them in the lake of fire and the people that declare their badge of whatever it is are proud of it and don't care about the absolute infinite holy God of the universe who will hold them in account and they will stand in front of him and they will declare he is righteous and holy for throwing them in the lake of fire but we're living in a darkening culture and it's just amazing how rapidly it gets dark but I know where we're headed because Jesus said like it was in the days of Noah so it shall be what in the days of the Son of Man when he returns and in the days of Noah it says in Genesis 6 that every imagination of the hearts of all humanity was only evil continually every all only continually I mean that is quite a very very deep indictment of our culture by the God of the universe and that's how it was so that there were only eight eight in the whole world that had any desire to look toward God everyone else was was only continuously thinking of sin and Jesus said like it was then it's how it's going to be when I return and the darkest moment in all of history will be the fact that when the Lord of glory returns almost every living breathing human being on the earth will be worshiping the devil himself instead of the Lord Jesus Christ it's actually going to get darker and darker and darker until everyone in Revelation 9 is committing murders thefts drug induced occultic stuff and immorality so we're just right on the pathway toward darkness so the question is are we getting ready to stand in the ever darker and ever more evil days that are in front of us Paul says that we're supposed to go through life without grumbling and complaining so that we may be blameless and harmless the sons of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse world holding forth the light and proclaiming the word of life that's Philippians 2 14 and onward we're supposed to shine brighter the darker and the more evil it gets around us did you know that did you know there's never a greater time to witness than as it gets dark it's not time for us to dim it's not time for us to step back it's not time for us to to lower our profile it's a time to stand see the scriptures say the darker the more evil the more wicked the more the more Satan has his way the more God wants us to stand so how do you do that well we're right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer where we're asking God to deliver us from the evil one the way we do that is by standing and we're just starting to look at our spiritual armor of God uh, and this armor that we are supposed to be wearing was given in the first time Paul taught about it to a group of people in Acts and that's where we're going to turn if you want to turn your Bibles to Acts 19 we're going to look at the backdrop for spiritual armor we're going to look at probably the darkest city of the ancient world the most infused with the occult with witchcraft with magic and with public immorality of all the cities of the empire this was the queen that had the most famous temple of the ancient world and it was the Mecca for those that wanted black arts that wanted occultic things and that wanted gross sensuality and in that place the Lord 
brought about one of the greatest revivals, perhaps the greatest revival that's ever been recorded in the scripture. It's astounding to look at. So chapter 19 of the uh, book of Acts. And as we open to Acts 19, 19 and 20, we meet a group of people that were convinced. They were convinced that God could deliver them from the evil one. That's what the Lord's Prayer said we're supposed to be asking. But they didn't just ask for it, they believed it. And they lived it in their culture in Ephesus. They enjoyed what may have been one of the greatest revivals in history, but they also understood and heeded what God said about the unseen world of spiritual pathogens, agents of destruction, agents of evil that are constantly around us. Well, for a moment, let's, let's talk about the unseen world because you have to talk about it because it's unseen. And most of us don't think about the world we don't see. That is reality. What we don't see is reality, and it is truly influencing what we do see that we think is reality. The unseen world. In the last hundred years, we've made some great strides as humanity toward understanding how dangerous part of the unseen world is. It's the physical part, are the dangerous germs and viruses. We know that even the smallest breach of our protective layer, our skin, even the smallest breach can become the place through which rush the hordes that can multiply into the millions within hours of, of pathogens, of germs, of viruses, of even little parasitic animals that can grow to be feet long, but they penetrate through our protective skin. This invasion point for the deadly armies of microbes and germs inside our defensive walls instantly, if they penetrate, can multiply and fill our bodies with toxins and disease. We all know that. I'm just talking about modern medicine. Because of our awareness, if we are walking somewhere and we see something that is deadly or we think could be deadly in a germ-infested way, we're immediately alarmed. Like if your child saw as you're walking behind the mall, you know, collecting boxes for something and you see a syringe back there and it's got fresh blood on it, if your child picked it up and started poking themselves, you'd be, I mean, you would tackle them and take it away from them and say, oh, you could die from that. Why? You can't see anything dangerous it's unseen but we know we're convinced of the unseen world being dangerous and it, I mean we're selling millions of gallons of germ killer for something we can't even see but everyone buys it because we know it's there and yet we don't seem to respond the same way for the unseen spiritual world we respond to physical situations because we're all convinced of the devastating effects of pathogens if they get into our body. Deadly disease producing germs as in virus and bacteria are what we would fear that needle or anything else might get into our child's body and sicken and, and harm them even take their life. This week I was reading a, a little bulletin from the uh, Mayo Clinic. Now I didn't go to the Mayo Clinic site, I was on Bloomberg, but Bloomberg always is trying to get you to other sites. I guess maybe that's the advertising thing, I don't know. But it was just titled, We Live in a World of Germs. And I thought, yeah, I, I, yeah. And it said, some keep you healthy and others make you sick. Protect yourself by understanding which ones are harmless and which ones pose a threat. That was the link, so I, I went. And this is what it said. Germs are behind every fever every runny nose, every ache, every pain, and every other sign and symptom of every cold and flu you've ever had. And when you're in the midst of those symptoms, you might not want to stop and think about the germs or microbes that are, they are causing them, but not all germs will harm you. And I guess maybe it was a yogurt ad after a while. I didn't finish reading it. I mean, you know, it was promoting the good ones. But basically what it says is germs in multitudes are unseen invaders and they're all around us and I mean it was just fascinating it talked about bacteria and viruses and infectious organisms it says they live everywhere you find them in the air and food and plants and animals and soil and water and just about every other surface including your own body and these microbes raise inside oh and the illustration of the size thing I mean it was amazing it said if this certain microbe was the size of home plate 
So I was trying to think, home plate, is that on Thanksgiving dinner or is that a sports illusion, you know? Because I'm sports challenged, and so I was thinking more of a plate at home. And it says, but if it was the size of home plate, the cell that it was in would be larger than the city block that surrounded the... And then I realized it was a sports thing, and it was trying to say the proportionate size. But basically what I was saying is they're very small but very deadly and, and all that. Basically, most of these organisms won't harm us. Our immune system protects us constantly against a relentless barrage of legions of attackers. It was a great article. Do you know what I got from it? There are two relentless wars raging all the time. There's the physical one, and it's worse than Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and wherever else, it's, you know, Algeria and Libya and blah, blah, blah. It's worse than all that. It's right here. It's right around us. It's right on us. And that relentless war is in the physical realm of these invaders that want to find a way through our skin or through the air or through the food and water and take their toxins and, and nefarious work inside of our body and harm us. We're all aware of that. The physical war involves our bodies, but the spiritual war involves our minds. Physically, we're the war target of one of the most amazing systems in our body, the immune system, and those, those pathogens are targeting that. And they're almost always unseen, and our amazing defensive system operates 24-7, warding off these legions of attackers. And they try and stop everyone that comes through a cut and scrape and puncture and breathing and eating. But spiritually, we're likewise under relentless attack, and yet we're not even afraid. And yet we're not even saying, don't, don't touch that. I mean, if you really thought about the spiritual thing, if someone picked up the remote, they'd say, you'd say, be really careful with that remote. Be really careful with that, that online device. You don't know what might be lurking out there. And I'm not talking about these wacky, weird, wicked predator. I'm talking about the spiritual influence that comes through the media and the, the music. And it comes through the visual, hard to ever forget images that are attached with a spiritual component. There are spiritual viruses that are attached to all these physical things that we ingest into our minds, into our lives. So basically, what's God's plan? He says, well, I've made you a spiritual immune system. He designed this incredible skin and, and all the other protective things of our physical body. He has also designed an even more intricate spiritual immune system. Basically, our immune system is laid out in the scriptures as having factors to ward off the continuous bombardment of Satan's attack. And one of the most amazing systems in our spiritual life is this immune system. And, and what's amazing is it's so simple. It has actually three parts. First of all, our health. Uh, we're spiritually healthy when we're eating and drinking God's word. That's the only food for our soul. It is the only method God has to bring us to health. It's the agent through which all this system operates. It's what empowers, it's what fuels, it's everything tied to the Word of God that renews our mind, that gives us peace, that gives us strength, gives us comfort, gives us hope, gives us the ability to say no to sin. And that gets exercised by eating this and drinking this when we walk in the Spirit, when we say, unleash that truth into my life. I want it. In fact, I have, I'm having the best time. Um, I started this year, actually I started the end of last year, with these groups and we're studying through the 52 greatest chapters in the Bible. Actually, it's just a front. Yeah, I mean, we're studying the Bible. We just have a cute name, you know, the 52 greatest chapters. But I ease each of the groups into the second level. And the second level is, and boy, it's wearing out my cell phone, um, we text each other every day. And we text each other, yes, no, or okay. Yes means, I sat in front of the mirror of the word, looked at myself, saw any part of my life that wasn't 
Christ-like, and I asked the Lord to start changing me in that area. In other words, I read the scriptures and I'm prayerfully applying it in my life. That's yes. No means I didn't. Okay means, well, I read the Bible, but I just did it. Nothing's happening. And every day, each of those men have to sit in front of the mirror of the word and decide whether they're going to let God change us in some way. But did you know that accountability, it's really cute. Some of them, the text comes through at like 4.59 a.m. And boy, those are the eager mirrors, and they're up there, and they're going to get it, and they're going to say yes, and boom. Others are 11.54 p.m. And what it is is they have full and rich lives, but they're not going to let a day go by that they don't eat and drink and exercise by saying, I want to walk in step with your spirit. Did you know that's what it's supposed to be like in church? Did you know that's, that's really what we all should be talking about with each other? It's easier to say, hey, you look nice. What did you think of that? How was the snow where you live? And have you done this or that? And when are you going to go to Florida? You know, and how is, uh, you know, da, 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 da. But you know what we're really supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be saying, are you eating and drinking every day? Where are you eating and drinking every day? How are you exercising in the spirit? That's the, really the only reason that we gather. That's part of our worship to God. If we don't do that, why don't we just all go to Panera and get fat, you know, and eat pastry? Why do we come here? We come here to stir each other up and to glorify God as we gather as his body, blameless and harmless in a crooked and perverse generation, to be lights and to help each other be a better light to hold forth the word of life. The second component is our armor. It isn't just enough to be healthy. God says if we're asking him to deliver us from evil, he's already provided the means. It doesn't just happen. It's not like, you know, whatever that guy is in the red suit of the, the new Marvel comics thing, the one that goes and it, the suit goes on him, uh, the iron guy. Uh, you know, he doesn't do anything. He just steps there and it goes on him. And we think that's how it is. We think God will do it if I need it. No. He says, you have to put it on. It's not going to fly to you. You have to put on the armor. And we need to use the armor that God commands us to wear. And it's interesting, the context, Ephesus. That's what Ephesians is the name of the book written to the city of Ephesus, to the people that lived in the shadow of the biggest alluring shrine to the devil and to immorality that was ever built. It's one of the seven wonders of the world. And it was built there, and this church was founded by Paul right in the shadow of that place. And Paul said, you got to be spiritually healthy or you're going to get consumed by the devil, and you will not make it if you don't have the protective, it's almost like going without skin. Can you imagine how long we would survive in this germ-filled world if we didn't have skin? That's why children that have that problem, they keep them in those sterile, you know, filtered air bubbles. Because they, you know, and people that are really ill with chemo, they, they keep them in isolation, away from the germs. Because they don't have protection. And Paul said, to the people in Ephesus in the book of Ephesians, he said, you can't live in the shadow of the devil and of sensuality and of materialism and of pride if you are not every day consciously putting on the armor. Because when you wear it, you engage in spiritual warfare. So spiritual healthy people know they need the armor because they're facing every day the legions of the world, the flesh, and the devil and all of the spiritual pathogens. And we have to learn healthily armed to say no, to resist the devil. Guess what? If we neglect any part of our spiritual immune system, Satan and his army have the entry point and they flood through. 
And most believers don't realize that their endless emotional struggles and ups and downs and discouragement and depression and darkness and all the troubles they have relationally with other people and their anxieties and fears and feeling empty and hopeless and worthless and, and listless and every other less you can think of is all tied to that. Satan is a master of flattening our tires and he knows just where to shoot his, his flaming missiles at any Achilles heel, any unprotected spot. And he knows what will get us down is either doubt or discouragement or despair or depression or irritability or anxiety or impatience or, or just burning lust for whatever we're lusting for. And that's what we face every day. And people that are spiritually healthy wearing their armor are more and more and more kept in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. They're not perfect and they're always susceptible, but they're far less sidelined and, and totally out of commission. Be you meet people, there's some people that are sick all the time. I, I know certain people, I've never known them to be well. I mean, they're always sniffling and something's wrong with them and, they're eight, and, and, they're, and, and you just accept that. Did you know spiritually we're not supposed to accept that? We're not supposed to accept that we are constantly living the way the devil wants us to live. And that happens when we're not healthy. I meet people, they say, I don't get anything out of the Bible, I'm not going to read the Bible. But they'll sit there and, and ingest as much of the occult as possible that comes through the television and through the internet and through the music and through the media and through all the, the other channels that they get. And they can't understand why they feel so hopeless and despairing. So they just watch more or go shopping, which is another form of Satan's allurement, materialism. And they don't get anything out of the Bible because they're not... Eating and drinking God's word and exercise by walking the spirit. Well, let's keep going. Basically, in chapter 19, which we're going to read, is a look at when God's word prevailed in dark Ephesus. And Ephesus experienced one of the greatest revivals in biblical history, and Paul went there to the godless heart of the Eastern Roman Empire, the city called Ephesus, and he confronted the evils of daily life that godlessness begets. Do you know what Satan's realm begets? A constant flow of materialism, sensuality, the occult, and pride. Those are what Satan wants us to be constantly living, you know, kind of like in China, some of those industrial cities, the people are breathing all this stuff that's destroying their bodies. Satan is polluting the atmosphere around all of us with materialism, with sensuality, with pride, and with the occult. And all four of those deaden the work of God in us. Materialism is idolatry, covetousness. Wanting more stuff is like bowing down to an idol. Because when we want the stuff, we sacrifice God. How many people do you know that are not here this morning because they have the second job to pay for something that's more important than God? That's idolatry. They don't gather with the body of Christ because they have material desires that are higher than their spiritual desires. Materialism, covetousness, God says, is idolatry. It's when God's time is superseded by our amusements, or our entertainment, or our recreation. And that recreation has become a god. And it has. There are people that worship at the shrine of the soccer field every day. It's their god. And Satan wants to pollute our souls. And into the most polluted city in the Roman Empire, Paul moves in. And he says, this is how you reach it. The sequence, the Spirit of God led Luke to capture, that we're going to read right now in Acts 19, shows that in this stop on Paul's missionary journey, Paul attacked the darkness of Ephesus through extensive and in-depth teaching of God's Word. Wow. There's no new, net, new technique. It's not like you've got to buy a book or a video to figure out what he did. 
every day. He rented a hall, and during lunch hour, siesta, you know, the Latin world, the Latin American world has their siestas. Latin is the language of Rome. That siesta time in South America came right from Rome. Rome shut everything down like noon to four. And everybody worked early in the morning till noon and had this nice long siesta. And they ate and slept and everything else. And then they went back to work at four and worked till late. And you go to Latin American countries and they get off work at nine or 10 and, and they go out to eat and they're eating at midnight. It's amazing. That's right out of the biblical world. And what did Paul do during their lunch hour? He taught for three or four hours every day in the school of Tyrannus. And, and that's how he defeated the darkness of Ephesus. What happened? Well, the kingdom of darkness was left shaken to the core. The, the, the rulers of the darkness of this world were confused and fighting against themselves. And, and out of that, God called a group of believers in Ephesus that formed the greatest church of the ancient world. Eusebius, the first church historian that lived in Caesarea, said that the church in Ephesus numbered 50,000 people during the ministry after Paul in Timothy's era. It, it mushroomed up till the one that Jesus wrote to in Revelation 2 had around 50,000 people. You, I mean, you think Willow Creek, was the, there was one bigger than that way back then. And how did it get that way? Well, at the zenith, it was the home church of Paul and Mary, the mother of our Lord, and John, the beloved apostle, and Timothy, and a galaxy of others. And the church at Ephesus was mentioned first in Revelation because they had zeal and fervency. And what caused their zeal and fervency? Well, it's right here in Acts 19, in verses 19 and 20. And some of you thought we weren't going to read it, but we are. So let's all stand together because you need to hear what happened. And, and to hear how God's word prevailed in the darkest city of all. And it's really simple. Look at verse 19 of Acts 19. And also, many of those, in fact, I've got to back up. This morning I backed up. I'm going to start in verse 17. And this became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Verse 18, and many others who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Verse 19, and many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Verse 20. So, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. That was one of the greatest revivals in history, in the darkest city. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that we would learn the backdrop of the armor, the warfare, and the spiritual health that we're supposed to live in every day because it works in the darkest place on earth. And it will work here, and it will work anywhere, and it's worked throughout all of church history. And I pray that we would let your name be magnified and your word to be exalted and to prevail in our lives. And when that happens, it flows into the city where we live. And the best way to reach Kalamazoo in a very desperate time is by us letting your word prevail inside of us and getting rid, like they did, of anything that displeases you. And then you, Lord Jesus, are magnified by every single one of us. And your word through us prevails in the lives of all that we come in contact with. Teach us that and start that and stir that in our lives this morning. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is only half time. Don't get any thoughts about that. Uh, costly choice. In fact, we were talking at the elders retreat, and I'm going to talk about that more tonight. But um, I've been in the ministry 38 years, long enough to know that we're down to the point where 
When I used to, when I started out in ministry 38 years ago, I, w I used to speak at Bible conferences and they had that Bible hour. Now it's the Bible 10 or 15 minutes, you know, and, and there's a, a lessening of the capacity of people to listen to the Bible. So we are, you know, planet Bible fitness and we are extending your capacity. What did they do? What, if I was to summarize Acts uh, 19 verses 19 and 20, what, what was the key to this astounding revival in this dark place? The people made costly choices to rid their lives of anything that displeased the Lord. Anything that displeased the Lord. And they, they publicly, did you see what it says? Look back at verse 19. Ephesus experienced costly choices. The level of their desire to repent and follow the Lord was seen in the costly choices to rid their lives of anything that displeased him. Their example, reported by God in his word, should stir us up. We should be asking ourselves, have, have we likewise carefully purged out of our lives any of those landing places for the devil? Is there anything in my life more important than God? Satan will will zero in on that. He'll, la he'll, he'll land like a fly, you know, right there on anything that displeases God. And he'll just camp and multiply. That's the goal. So we get rid of anything that draws the, the attention of the devil. As you look at verse 19, it's an amazing verse. What did God lead Paul to do that prompted such a huge response in public? What did Paul say to them? Have you ever thought about that? When you read verse 19, what did he do without the internet? He didn't tweet them and he didn't message them and, and he didn't buy airtime and he didn't, you know, have Google AdWords. How did he do that? What was he saying to them that caused such a huge public response? In fact, have you ever wished that you could actually hear what Paul told them to make them respond so dramatically to the evil around them? What did Paul say that made them go home and search through their houses and gather and, and come and publicly burn expensive media? That's what this was. The, the word books, actually it's a, a, it's a technical word for what was purchased at that temple to Diana. Uh, the, the, the seventh wonder, one of the seven wonders of the world, the media of that place that was, that was quintessentially uh, worshiping the occult materialism and sensuality. And the people paid dearly for the, the, the magical arts of that place. And they had them in their homes. And they got saved, but they still had them in their homes. What did Paul say that made them search out their house and come and publicly renounce that stuff? That's, that's why I love Bible study. Those are the kind of questions I'm, I'm thinking constantly. Well, did you know the Holy Spirit captured for each of us Paul's message of what he actually told the saints to hear? I mean, I've heard a lot of people say, I wish I was there, I could have heard it. Well, you know what's better than being there? Not everything Paul said was wonderful. What is wonderful, God caught for us. And Paul wrote it down under the inspiration of God's Spirit. In fact, let's go to Ephesians. You're in Acts. Go to the right. Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. And look at chapter 4. And I'll just summarize what Paul said in chapter 4. Because we can listen to what Paul preached, what Paul taught, and what Paul prayed for these saints. And that's what the book of Ephesians is. It's the, it's the cream of all the messages he gave for all those hours in that rented school that the Holy Spirit wanted all of us to hear. He wanted them to hear the ones they heard. He wants all of us to hear these. And so they're written down for us. As we listen to that, basically, it should stir us to want to empty out any part of our lives that grieves, quenches, and displeases God and shut any doors for the devil and his demons in our lives because Satan is not interested in a head-on confrontation with Christ. He usually doesn't kick down the front door and walk in. Rather, he'll always quietly slip into any unguarded areas. He'll come in the back door, any door left unlocked, any window left open, any other means of establishing a beachhead. And just like germs, Satan and his system are relentlessly 
checking every door and every window and every security system of our life. They are the ultimate pathogens. And Paul preached and taught and discipled and reasoned longer and deeper here in Ephesus than any other church because they were in the darkest place. So he stayed the longest and taught the most. And the response was amazing. Well, what did he teach him? This is, this is the heart of Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Basically, he said, always a guard in your life and promote a lifestyle of shedding your old life. Uh, something fascinating happened to me this week. <clears throat> you know, it, we had our snow day. Actually, it wasn't a snow day. I worked that day, but you know, it was a snow day for the office. And, uh, and, and so I decided that I would conquer that heavy, wet snow, so I shoveled three times. And, and so I wasn't gonna let it stay. I just kept going out and shoveling. And uh, I was sitting at lunch with Bonnie and, and, and she was smiling at me, but she kept leaning closer to me like this. And I was just all excited to know what she was gonna do. And so I was smiling at her and she kept leaning closer to me and she said, are you growing a mustache? And I said, I'm not growing a mustache. It's snow day, so I didn't shovel. I mean, I didn't shave. I shoveled instead of shaving. I said, it's snow day. I didn't shave. I shoveled. And she looked at me and she said, and that much grows in one day? I said, yeah, you know. It's, I, I mean, I should have shares in the razor company, uh, you know, because I use a lot of them. What was interesting was, that normally, you know, I get up in the dark and I shave, and when she sees me at lunch, I don't look that way. And so she saw the normal me and saw the presence of something that wasn't normal. Now think about that. And she's close enough to me that she was scrutinizing me and saying, something is changing, what are you doing? Now look down at these verses, because it's talking about the church having the same relationship that, that Bonnie was having with me in our accountability to each other. We're all supposed to be looking at each other and saying, are you putting off, verse 22, concerning your former conduct, the old man that grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts? Are you doing that? Because I can see, I see it growing back. I see you acting like you used to. I see that, that anger, I see that, that boastful, that pride, that, that centrality of your desires and your needs and that's all you're thinking about. I, I see that anxiety. Are you growing an anxious mustache, you know? Are, are you growing, uh, it, it's coming out of your life. Did you know that people close to you should see a decrease of your temper, a decrease of untruthfulness, a decreasing anxiety. Did you know there are people that are more fearful every time you meet them? They're fearful of everything. They're fearful for their health, they're fearful for their money, they're fearful for people breaking in, they're fearful, they're afraid of being afraid of everything and they're just afraid. And no one near them goes, are you growing that beard of fear on purpose? Do you know it's growing? You're supposed to, verse 22, be getting, putting off, shaving off, getting rid of, concerning the old way you were, the old man, the, the, the pre-Christ you, the, the one that's corrupt with lust. But it is enough just to shave. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, verse 23 says. And put something new on top of that, put on the new man which was created. Note Paul describes the actions after the Ephesians were saved. Look back, the, the saved is verse 17 to 19. And testified, no longer walk as the rest of Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, verse 17. Their understanding was darkened, they were alienated, they were past feelings, they gave themselves over to lewdness. That's, that was before you were saved. Now that you're saved, keep putting off all the whiskers of the old you that grow. And we all have them. I don't mean whiskers. I'm talking about the old us. 
And we all are supposed to be getting rid of it. And people that really love us notice and should say something when we're not getting rid of. Paul reminded those people and asked them to start a lifestyle of shedding the old life repeatedly. Old habits like old clothes are so comfortable, they fit us so well, we often forget we even have them on until the Spirit of God convicts us through his word and through those around us. And Paul was reminding that those who live a life holy to the Lord must repeatedly put off the old ways. And if we struggle with anger, anger has to be shed daily. And if we struggle with pride, pride has to be shed daily. And this is the choice we make for lust and greed and fear and any other byproduct of our flesh. And most believers that fail to grow in their spiritual lives fail to grow because they do not understand the lifelong need to shed and get rid of the old life. They just think God's going to do it all. Let go and let God do it all. And God says, I won't do what you're supposed to do. And if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to reap the consequences. Be not deceived, God's not mock. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. He that sows the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. If you don't get rid of and put to death the flesh and you allow it to keep coming back into your life and into my life, we are going to reap the corruption of our relationships, of our joy, of our fruitfulness, of our usefulness. It corrupts everything. If we don't have a lifestyle getting rid of it. Next, look at verse 23. It doesn't stop with shedding. It has to be a lifestyle of renewing our minds. Verse 23 says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Uh, doesn't that make you think of, of Romans 12? Verse 23 is just Paul kind of doing a reminder. He's, he's, he's doing a hyperlink back to what Romans 12 says. Paul says our minds has to change, not just our behavior. Choices to put off the old things flow from a renewed mind. As Romans 12, 2 says, we're transformed when our minds are renewed. When we think godly, we behave godly. When we believe right, we behave right. How is that done? It's done by the reading of the word of God. That's the only way it's done. The only way to change, the only way to renew our minds, the only way for us, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The non-material part of us is only restored by the word of God. It can be stabilized by chemicals. It can only be restored to the way it's supposed to operate by the Word of God. Only. Only the Word of God. This is done by reading and studying God's Word and by asking the Holy Spirit to continue His renewing work. Yes, okay, no. See, every day, the Bible study brothers. Yes, I'm allowing God to do His renewing, sanctifying work. Okay, I want to, but I'm not really making any progress. No, I'm not. And boy, if you get a no, they actually drive over and check on the guy. See, what's going on with you? What are you texting us no? You know, you want to get a visit, say no, you know. Boom. Uh, they come and check. Because the Word of God gives us God's very thoughts. That's why it's his word. It's what he's thinking. And a prayerful meditation on what God is thinking infuses our mind with his constant renewal. This is why every Christian should be regularly, daily, allowing God to speak into their life. This is why it's valuable to read through the Bible regularly. It's imperative that we read expectantly, looking at the mirror and saying, what do you want to change? But we have to keep in mind that we don't just put the new man on merely by putting off the old. We need to do what verse 24 says. Look at verse 24. Put on. We need to put on love. We need to put on peace. We need to put on joy. We need to put on patience. For example, we lose our temper with our children and we repent of it and put it off, but we haven't completed our responsibility unless we put on love and patience. It's not enough to just say, I was wrong, Lord, forgive me, but to say, Lord, I want your love and patience. You know, that just happened to me, made me think of that. Yesterday, I, I came home and walked to the counter, and there was the 
coffee that they, the kids, I could tell it was them that made it, and it had overflowed, and it ran down, it was down the counter, it was going down the cupboards, and it was on the floor. And my immediate, non-prompted by Christ response was, I walked to their office and I said, do I have to constantly clean up after you guys? And they looked up stunned. They didn't even know what I was talking about. And so I went in and, you know, grudgingly cleaned it up and felt really bad, you know, and thought, you know, what if I'd had a stroke right after that? The last thought of me would have been, you know. And so, so I repented, and then I put on love and patience, and then I walked back into the office, and they both went like this, you know. Now what are you going to say? And I said, I was wrong the way I talked to you. And I am sorry, because I never should talk that way. Will you please forgive me? And you should have seen the looks on their faces. Kind of like the looks on your face when someone does that to you. They just said, oh, you know, you know we're sorry, we shouldn't do that. And, we didn't. and I said, no, no, I was wrong. Do you know what the nine most important words are in every relationship with any human the rest of your life? Nine words. I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. See, it's not enough just to get rid of. We have to be renewed and put on the new man. And all of this is only through God's grace and works have no place in obtaining salvation or in gaining merits. And the Christian life is by grace alone. Nevertheless, the Apostle Paul said, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. God wants to be at work in us, but as children of grace, we must work at our Christian lives. We have our part to do in dressing ourselves with the divine wardrobe. By the way, in the scriptures, clothes really do make the man or the woman if we clothe ourselves with the spiritual wardrobe of Christ. Well, let's go quickly to... Uh, where we're going to pick up next time. What happens when revival comes? Well, back in Acts 19, if you turn back there, what happened in their lives? And I want to set the stage for where we're going to be next time. These people came. They said, they started saying the sin in their life, confessing. They started tearing out of their lives anything that displeased God. They threw it down, destroyed it, and said publicly, we no longer want this to have anything to do with our lives. And what does Acts 19 say? In verse 17, it says, Jesus was magnified. And look what verse 20 says, And the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed in that city. Kalamazoo's had all kinds of shock waves with the murders. What's the best way to reach the town? For us to renounce any darkness in our life so the treasure inside of us can shine out did you know what it says in Acts 1 Be my witnesses. It isn't saying anything. Be. Let me fill your life so much that people see Christ and then tell them what they're seeing. But let him be shown first, which only comes by scraping off the old us every time we see it, changing our mind continuously, repenting of the old us and then putting on the new us that's created in Christ Jesus for good works. Let's all stand. And as you stand, I'd like to encourage you to bow with me because right now, for the next 30 seconds, before you change channels, you're probably thinking about something, the old whiskers of the old you. And the Bible says that we're not supposed to just hear this. We're supposed to do something about it. So as you're standing with heads bowed before the Lord, what old you is showing? The people closest to you probably know some of it, but only you know all of it and God. Are you willing this morning to put off the old man that's corrupt according to deceitful lusts? If so, right in your heart, say, Lord... I don't want that fear. I don't want that anxiety. I don't want that lust. 
I don't want those things that so easily beset me. I repent right now. And then you have to get in the Word and let it renew your mind. And then in the Word, you have to put on the new you and me that God created. While you're thinking about it, start the process right here. Father in heaven, I pray that you would mightily prevail in our lives through your word and that you, Lord Jesus, would be magnified in the way we talk, the way we respond to each other, the way we live. May, may you shake our town by changing us from the inside out. And we ask that so that you be exalted. And we ask that as your body this morning in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.